Hello, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. Um, I'm, uh, thank you to our sponsors who allow us to uh, run through events like this. Uh, I want to thank Datadog. It is a global technology company that provides a cloud-based security and observability platform for cloud applications. Uh, and I want to introduce Allied, who's our speaker, who's going to run us through some cool Azure stuff. Thank you very much. Um, so today we're going to be unmasking uh, some of the hidden APIs between in Microsoft Azure and Microsoft Entry. We're going to be going behind the curtain and exploring them. Before we jump into it, I'm just going to briefly introduce myself. So my name is Alid Mehta. I'm the founder of an organization called Dolphin Labs. So this was a company I set up earlier in the year, primarily focusing on cloud and DevOps security research and training. So I've got coming up to 10 years experience in cloud. I think we're a couple months off that at the moment. Primarily being in the Microsoft space, so yeah, a lot of Azure, Entra, M365, all of that fun stuff. And there's where you can find me online. If you've got any questions, want to collaborate on anything cool, please feel free to reach out to me whenever. Before we get into the meat of it, I thought it made sense if we quickly go through what my goals were here, why I was doing this work in the first place, what I was trying to achieve here. So there were two main questions that I was trying to answer. Question one, how can we interact with Microsoft Cloud? And I want to understand this both from the perspective of the documented supported methods, as well as all the other ways that are out there as well. And secondly, how can we document this effectively? How can we do this in a scalable and maintainable way where it's actually going to be useful for security and technology communities to be able to use it? And there are a few outcomes I wanted to get from this. I wanted to understand the attack surface of these environments. I think for too often, we've kind of assumed that the attack surface is as the service providers present it to us but quite a lot of the time it actually stems way further than that. Very keen to encourage further research in this space. As will be clear through this talk, my job's not done here yet. There's a lot left to do. There are some people who are doing some really cool work around undocumented APIs already, such as Nick Rochette over in the AWS space, but there's a lot left to do still. And finally, I wanted to publish some kind of open source project for sharing this and hopefully to encourage more things to be shared in a similar fashion. So how are we going to cover this? Just a quick agenda. I'm going to go through how we interact with the Microsoft Graph, what are the supported documented methods of doing so, and then how else can we interact with the uh, Microsoft Cloud? What are some of the other uh, interfaces exposed, some of the in other interfaces available to us? I'm going to go through some of the approaches and challenges that we had around API enumeration, and similarly for the documentation as well. And finally, how can we use this? What can we do with this information? How can it help us? So start with, how do we interact with the Microsoft Cloud? Like, what are the supported documented ways? So there's a few current ways of doing so. Um, if you work with Azure, you're probably familiar with the Microsoft Graph. This is kind of the de facto standard for interacting with the Microsoft Identity Platform, as well as a lot of integrated services such as M365, etc. So Microsoft published this in a number of different ways. So they've got an open API spec available for it. There's documentation around using the REST APIs, and they publish a load of client SDK libraries so you can consume it in whatever language you want. On the Azure side of things, they're uh, broken into two main categories. We've got the resource manager APIs. So as the name suggests, for managing the resource. So these are for control plane actions, such as creating, deleting, updating a resource. So creating a storage account, for example. We've got the data plane APIs as well. And these are for interacting with the actual data stored within these services. So for example, getting the data from a storage blob. But as I'm sure you can appreciate, with services as varied and deeply integrated into organizations, it gets quite challenging for them to deprecate and retire old services and interfaces. So we've got a few legacy APIs as well, which are still knocking around. The most well-known of these, most popular, is probably the Azure Active Directory graph. Um, so this was the old way of interacting with uh, Azure Active Directory, what's now Microsoft Entra. Um, interestingly, this one's used quite extensively in security tooling. So for example, Azure Hound, part of the Bloodhound project, uses it for a lot of its Entra collection. Um, and we also see APTs using these APIs quite extensively over the past couple of years. One lesser known one is the provisioning API, also for interacting with Azure Active Directory. Uh, if you've been in the space for a while, you might remember the old MS Online PowerShell commandlets. Um, these were powered by this API. So it's a SOAP XML based API for user and license management, kind of fun stuff. But how else can we interact with the Microsoft Cloud? So in the initial stage of my research, I came across quite a few different ways. And this list is by no means exhaustive. There's so many other APIs out there as well. These were just some of the ones that 
the names indicated more interesting functionality. So we've got some stuff around privileged identity management, identity governance, uh, application management. And the one we're going to be focusing on for the purposes of this talk is this one right here. It's the main.iam.ad.ext.azure.com. Nicer name is the Ibiza IAM API. We'll go into the specifics of that in a second, but why should we care about this at all? Why am I doing this research? And what's the security implication of some of these APIs? A few reasons. Number one, logging. So if you've been working with Entio, you probably understand that logging in telemetry has been a bit of a challenge for quite some time. It is getting a lot better. We've got the new Microsoft Graph Activity Logs, which allow you to uh, get telemetry on read events, including write events. Uh, but as the name suggests, specific to the Microsoft Graph API. So this is going to be, continue to be a gap in coverage. I should point out that um, state changing actions should still be logged in the audit logs. Um, might not always be the case, there might be gaps there, and they're not always logged in a consistent manner. Secondly, is functional behavior. Whilst a lot of these APIs have similar functionality to the documented supported APIs, it doesn't always behave in the same way. So one such example was some research that SecureWorks did over the past couple of years, where they found it was possible to manipulate the last modified timestamp on a conditional, action, a conditional access policy through some of these undocumented APIs. So I'd certainly expect similar issues to be present with some of the others. And finally, access control. It's pretty hard to control access to stuff when you don't know it's there. Um, I'll talk about some specifics around consent in a couple of slides, but yeah, generally access control gets a little bit harder when we don't know what these APIs or these interfaces are. So, what is this API that I'm interested in and I'm talking about today? So, Ibiza was the code name for the Azure portal. The portal that we know and love today uh, was originally uh, developed and published under the name Ibiza. And this portal was built in a modular and extensible fashion. So you ex essentially have the uh, skeleton of the portal and you load in separate blades. And these blades represent either a service or a service component. And um, by using this extensible model, they can support all the different services within a standardized interface. But to be able to support this, developers at Microsoft need to be able to build extensions. So that's where this Ibiza IAM API comes in. It's an extension for the Ibiza portal. Um, there's some information about like, what the URI is, the application ID, which we'll need for getting tokens in a moment. And that link at the bottom is actually a really interesting repo. So it's published by Microsoft. Um, it's documentation around the architecture and the design of the portal. It looks like they're moving a lot of these docs internally now, so unfortunately we won't get a lot of updates to them, but it was super handy for understanding the architecture and how this solution is built. So, how is this API used by Microsoft? Well, as I was saying earlier, it's an extension for the portal. So when I'm clicking around in the portal, going through some of the entry functionality, we can see that my browser is making calls to this API. So in this specific example, we're calling the permissions endpoint to get the user's effective permissions, and uh, we're ca calling directory endpoint to get some properties about the current tenant that we're authenticated against. But how else does Microsoft use this? Well, interestingly, I found the Azure CLI tool actually uses this API as well to provide uh, capabilities to consent to registered applications. And this raises an interesting point about this API is, whilst a lot of the functionality is similar to the Graph API and it does similar things, there is some functionality that is exclusive to this API. So we have some other things around uh, Microsoft Entry Connect as well, which aren't exposed through some of the better known APIs. So can we use these two? Before I answer that question, I just want to talk quickly about how the uh, authorization model typically works in um, Azure AD or Entry ID. Do bear in mind, I have simplified this, so please don't use this as a reference for OAuth, but for the context of this, it should be sufficient. So broadly, we've got four parties involved. We've got the user, we've got the client that they're using, we've got Entry ID as the identity provider, and we've got the resource that they're trying to access. Flow works something like this. User accesses the client. Client goes away and requests a token from Entry ID. Entry goes back to the user, requests consent. User provides consent for the client to access those resources on their behalf. Entry can then issue a token to the client and the client can access resources on behalf of the user. So this is typically how it works. If you're registering your own application, you have to go through this process. But interestingly enough, with a lot of Microsoft first party applications, it's not really the case. They take out these middle consent steps here. They provide uh, pre-consented applications. They have clients which they have pre-consented and all tenants can access specific resources. 
what's the relevance of this? Well, it's just taken away another control that administrators would typically have, because admins can control what user can consent to what applications and what scopes they're able to do. So this is referring back to those access control issues that I was mentioning earlier. And this is exactly how it works for the Azure portal and the Ibiza IAM API. We don't have to deal with the consent there, which makes sense. They just want the portal to work. But if you recall from a couple of slides ago, the Azure CLI also uses this uh, API as well. So we find that the Azure CLI also has pre-consented scopes here, which makes it really easy to get a token for this. We can just do AZ account, get access token, and then the application ID of the API. Cool, so we can get a token now, either just grab it from our browser session or using the AZ CLI. But what do we do with it? Like, how do I know what APIs to call? What operations are available? What functionality can I do now? So we need to start enumerating it. So to start off with, I could just browse around the portal. As I said, the portal is making these calls for you. I can just proxy my traffic and I can build up a collection of these APIs. But it's not particularly scalable. It's restricted to wherever in the portal I'm specifically looking at. And I've got no kind of assurance that I'm getting good coverage here. So another area I looked as well was actually in GitHub. Um, so these APIs aren't new and people do know about them found a lot of references to them in a variety of projects. Some of them security projects, so for example, AAD Internals uses it. Interestingly, a lot of these just seem to be administrators trying to get their job done. The functionality wasn't exposed through um, a supported API, so they use this instead. So this helped a lot, um, gave me a much better feeling for how the API worked, how it was structured, what kind of functionality was available, but still quite limiting and restricted to those 356 files and whatever code people have written before. So we need something a little bit better. So if we have a look at kind of how this interaction typically works, I've got my portal in my browser down at the bottom, and then we've got the Ibiza API um, that we're interacting with. But there's actually another party at play here, which is this portal hosting service. So the way this actually works is when I'm clicking through the portal, I load up a new blade, uh, my browser will make a call to this portal hosting service, and it will load in a JavaScript file from there. And this JavaScript file will contain all the necessary information for interacting with the um, Ibiza IAM API. The issue is I'm still gonna be restricted to like where I'm clicking around in the portal. I now just need to go to the necessary blades, but still slow, not scalable, and I'm not gonna get um, full coverage, or at least I haven't got assurances that I've got full coverage there. But interestingly enough, what I came across a couple of weeks ago was a manifest file. So I found that the portal hosting service actually stores a manifest file for each of the extensions, and within this manifest file, it um, contains references to what dependencies are needed for what specific blades here. So this made it a lot easier. I could just pass that file, go away, download all those JavaScript files, and then I have a lot more assurance that I'm getting good coverage here. I should point out that I don't think this has got everything still. There were APIs and M uh, operations that I found prior to doing this which weren't included in the dependencies, whether they're legacy, whether they're not currently in use. I don't know, but this got me way better coverage than previously. So now I can just go away, interact directly with the API. Perfect, but what do we find? What can this API do? What functionality is available in it? Well, quite a lot actually. So you see here, we found just shy of 300 operations that are available through this API. So that's 286 distinct actions that I can perform against Microsoft Entry, whether that be authentication management, such as MFA, conditional access policy, users, groups, applications, B2C tenants. That's a lot of functionality exposed through here. But then I had my next challenge, which was, what do I do with this information? How do I share it in a usable uh, and maintainable way with the community? So ultimately, so I just write a specification for it. Went for OpenAPI for a few reasons. Number one, it's got a pretty mature ecosystem around code generation. There's a lot of tools that you can generate, uh, client SDKs, documentation sites even, just based off the specification. So super handy and hopefully would increase adoption by being able to do it in this method. OpenAPI is pretty flexible. I think one of the things I discovered pretty early on when looking at these APIs is they're inconsistent with how they're structured, what parameters they expect, what responses they provide. But thankfully, OpenAPI was flexible that it's been able to accommodate for all of these scenarios thus far. It was also, as I mentioned a bit earlier on, a lot of the Microsoft APIs are currently documented but like, uh, like this. 
and a lot of the Azure SDKs and Microsoft Graph FD SDKs are actually auto-generated from this specification. So that's specifically using a tool that Microsoft built in-house called AutoRest, but there's loads of other ones available, such as OpenAPI Generator. Now, probably wondering, how can you use this? What can you guys get from this? So there's a few ways. Number one, I'm very happy to release nodoc.cloud today. Um, so at the moment, this only has the Ibiza IAM API available through it, um, but I will be publishing the further APIs that I'm researching in this site as well. It's built with a tool called Scalar, so this site is fully automatically generated from the specification. Scalar guys are awesome, by the way, they're doing some really cool work at the moment. If that doesn't work for you, there's Postman Collections as well. There are links to this collection in that Nodoc site, so you don't have to write down that long URL, but these, again, auto-generated from the spec. You can interact with the APIs through this as well. And if that doesn't work, you can just grab the specification files from the repositories. So this is the master repository, and it's got links to the specific APIs in there. We can download the spec, use it in whatever code gen tool works for you, and hopefully that can encourage and increase the adoption of these tools. I mentioned uh, earlier there were a lot of useful GitHub repos that I got some code from. And this was a list of them, so very, a very big thank you for all those guys for the work they previously done. It really helped me get a feel for how this worked. But I think one of the key points here is my job's not done here. We're just getting started, right? There is a seldom explored area of the industry. I think a lot more research needs to go into it. We need to stop assuming that uh, the cloud providers attack surfaces as they presented it to us. We need to continue working here. We need to understand that a lot of our telemetry and logging, we can't be reliant on assuming that people are interacting with these services in standard ways. We need to look at holistic analysis to be able to get effective threat detection, uh, particularly against these APIs. And thank you very much. If anyone's got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right, there we go. Thank you, that was awesome. Um, question, what approach did you take? You mentioned getting all the JavaScripts uh, that mentioned the endpoints. Did, were there specific projects or tools you used to get that into the open API spec? Uh, writing about 20,000 lines of YAML manually. <laughs> I, I wrote the spec by hand pretty much. There were, I did a bit of automation, but mostly around just uh, grapping out the operations, etc. But the issue is, uh, within those JavaScript files, it contained no information about like what parameters um, I needed to call those API, or at least very limited information around the parameters. No information around the responses that were returned from it. So I had to interact with every API to understand how it works. <laughs> Well, thank you twice then. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So what do you think maintaining this is going to look like as AWS, or excuse me, as Azure releases more services and maybe... Yeah, it's, it's, certain, it's certainly going to be a challenge. I haven't 100% worked that out to be honest, but it seems that with a lot of these, uh, they don't seem to remove a lot of functionality, they add new things in. So I'm planning on setting up kind of regular scans against that metadata endpoint so that I can grab any new dependencies in, but it's still gonna be a fairly manual process of going through those dependencies and finding out what the operations are after that. All right, well thank you for attending. Thank you to our speaker. Uh, we'll be back here at the bottom of the hour. So thanks everybody.